So now Hymon is exited, and Creon and the chorus are present. Uh, Antigone is about to be led in, um, and uh, and the chorus is talking about what they've just seen, um, how hurt Hymon is, and how fierce his mind is. Um, and Creon says that let Hymon go. But these two girls he shall not save from death. And the chorus corrects him. Wait, do you mean to kill both of them? And then Creon has to kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, Ismene didn't do anything. So notice then, I mean, Creon's gotten so hot-headed at this point that, you know, he even got confused about how many women he was going to put to death. Uh, so, um, I, I mean, I think we're meant to see him as being excessive in his pursuit here. And now he describes how she's going to die. He's going to uh, have her led into a rocky cavern. She'll have just enough food that the city can avoid pollution. But she's going to be sealed up in a cavern until she dies. Awful. Awful way to go. Okay, now the uh, chorus launches into a short ode um, on the nature of love which is appropriate at this point, given that love is being uh, extinguished, the love of Hymon and Antigone, and the love between brother and sister is being uh, used as a reason for the death of the sister. All right. So, um, we now uh, can say, enter Antigone at 862, or 861, excuse me, uh, and she must be led by guard sentries, right? She's coming here as a captive. This scene is often referred to as the death march scene, where Antigone says that she's going to be led on this march. She sets out on her last road, and uh, she. there's a lot of marriage language here. Of course, we had a lot of marriage language in the Hymon scene, but there's a lot of marriage language that comes out here. She says, look, I've known nothing of marriage songs, so I'm a, I'm a woman who um, has, uh, has not yet been married, and instead my husband will be the lord of death. All right? The chorus responds to that, and they, they seem to have some sympathy here for her. Um, and they say to her clearly, it was your own choice. And alone among mankind, you will descend alive to that world of death. So they're acknowledging, you know, this wasn't a fated thing, that this was a choice that she made, okay? And Antigone brings up a uh, mythological reference um, to Niobe. The chorus corrects her and says, yeah, look, but that's a, that's a god you're talking about. You're just a mortal, okay? Okay. Um, and Antigone takes that as an insult. And she's upset, rightly, I think. She feels like she's dying wrongly. Um, and she wants, to, uh, she wants everybody to see that as she's going to a prison, which is her tomb, that she should be pitied. Neither among the living nor the dead do I have a home in common. Neither with the living nor the dead. Basically, she doesn't belong. Um, interestingly, the chorus... And notice, Creon hasn't responded to her yet. This is all Antigone and the chorus. They respond to her by saying, Look, you went to the extreme of daring. You went too far, and you fell. Uh, and maybe it was because some of, of some familial curse... Perhaps it was from some ordeal of your father that you were paying requital. Interesting, because, you know, this is the first time we've ever really heard about a familial curse on the house of Thebes. Um, once again, I, as I said in class, you know, there are a number of inconsistencies among the three Theban plays, because they were written over such an extended time. Okay, so now Antigone... Um, says that the chorus has reawakened a painful, um, a painful place for her, which is her feeling of pity for her father. Um, and uh, she acknowledges the parents she was born of, and now she's going to see them again. Um, and the curse has been on her too. 
So she's saying, brother, namely, who's also father, it was a luckless marriage you made, um, and dying killed my life. All right. That also could be a reference to her brother Polynices, though, in the luckless marriage in the sense that uh, the, the marriage in the Civil War, if you're talking about that metaphorically. All right. Notice the chorus again offers a kind of rebuke to her and says there is a certain reverence for piety. So you did the right thing in terms of piety, but for him in authority, he cannot see that authority defied. So basically they're taking her to task and saying she did this incorrectly. Um, and it's your own self-willed temper that has destroyed you. Notice that. Um, every time the chorus has said something to her, they've said it's been through choice. It was either her own will, uh, her own daring, or on the previous page, uh, at 875, it was your own choice. Okay? So, again, no tears for me, no friends, no marriage. Brokenhearted, I am led along the road ready before me. I shall never again be suffered to look upon the holy eye uh, of day, but my fate claims no tears, no friend cries for me. So basically she's saying that she's being led away, uh, unmourned for, unpitied. All right. Now here are, now Creon speaks up. Okay. And he basically just gives an order. Lead her to the tomb, lock her in the tomb, and leave her alone there. Uh, she can either live alone, buried in there, um, or she can die if she wants. Yeah, but we're guiltless, right? It's pretty dubious to say he's guiltless, but that's at least what Creon thinks here at this point. All right? Now look at, uh, and this is Antigone's final speech here, um, and she says, tomb bridal chamber, prison forever. So look at how she's equating her tomb and her bridal chamber. Notice again, we're seeing this motif of repeated use of language of marriage. All right. Um, so, and she talks about herself as being a, long, a one in a long line of her family that is suffering and dying. Um, and she earned this death through caring for the body of Polynices. All right. And she says, uh, she makes an interesting comparison here. She says, uh, there's a reason why I, it was so important to bury my brother, because my parents were dead. So if I didn't, I can't have another brother, so I have to bury him. And she says, look, if, uh, if my husband had died, I wouldn't have had to do this, because I could have married another husband and had a child from that other husband. But with both my parents dead, there's no way for me to have another brother. Interesting kind of comparison she makes there. Not even seems really necessary, but it does remind us of the, the husband relationship. So again, this, this whole scene has been permeated with language of marriage. Okay, So uh, again, she says, I'm a criminal and I'm now taken by the hand and led away, unburied, unbedded without bridal, without share in marriage, without nurturing of children. So she's been unable to fulfill any of those traditional female roles. And she closes here with a series of questions. What law of God have I broken? Why should I look, still look to the gods in my misery? Whom should I summon as an ally? Right? That series of rhetorical questions um, to express her plight. And she says here then, in stating the contradiction of her situation, because of her piety, I was called impious. So because of her pious action, namely burying her brother, she was called impious. All right. Um, okay. So now Creon says, finally, to the guards, get yourselves moving. All right. And... They start moving with her, and Creon says, I will not comfort you um, with the hope that the sentence will not be accomplished. So basically, Antigone, you're not getting away with this. All right, and now come her final words. She says, I, have let, I am led away. I have no more stay. Um, look on me, Prince of Thebes, the last remnant of the old royal line. 
See what I suffer and who makes me suffer, because I gave reverence to what claims reverence. All right. That is Antigone's death march. <laughs>